Here's something to get your brain working. What do you get when you take the number 11 and double it 11 times? Doesn't matter how many times you double it, you get 22 every time. <laughs> By the way, 22 is an extremely unlucky number. For me, we're going for 22. 22, 22, 12. 22. How much did you Shit. lose? <laughs> That's from the movie Lost in America. Okay, a lot of you know that John Conway has worked a lot on tilings. There's the work he did with Penrose on Penrose tilings. There's follow-up work he did with Charles Radin on pinwheel tilings. There's the work he did on classifying the different ways polygons can periodically tile the plane. And if some of this work is familiar to you, it's probably because Martin Gardner wrote about it. But there's another contribution Conway made to the study of tilings that's a bit more technical and less well known. This is work on what are sometimes called boundary homotopy methods. This work was written up by Jeff Ligarius and was later explained in a more geometrical way by Bill Thurston in an article called Conway's Tiling Groups. So I'm not going to use the word homotopy again, I promise. I'll just use the phrase tiling groups. Here's the sort of problem that Conway was looking at. It's a close relative of the sort of reptile problems that Solomon Gallom spoke about earlier. The picture shows small polyominoes, which Thurston calls two stacks of hexagons, that tile a larger region, a 12 stack of hexagons. Conway and Thurston used Conway's method to determine for exactly what values of M and N an N stack can be tiled by M stacks. I tried to popularize Conway's method in an article I published in Mathematics Magazine. I'll present the idea behind Conway's method with a very simple example. Here's on the left a region that can be tiled by rhombuses, and on the right a region that can't. Your eyes and visual cortex like to interpret the tiling on the left as a projection of a polygonal surface made of 12 squares tilted at various angles. Look at the, look at the screen. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and it's not hard to program computers to infer the three-dimensional structure from its two-dimensional projection. But even a partial tiling like the one at the right would cause the computer program to choke because there's no globally consistent way to assign three-dimensional coordinates to the points in the image. This is related to the Reutersvard triangle illusion reinvented by Penrose and Penrose and popularized by Escher through many representations of impossible figures. Solvable tiling problems give rise to possible figures. Therefore, impossible figures can only arise from unsolvable tiling problems. So to prove that a tiling problem is unsolvable, you find a way to associate it with an impossible figure. And metaphorically speaking, that's what Conway did for a number of tiling problems using his tiling groups. Now, this stuff is known to people who study tilings, but hardly anyone knows, including Conway, the impact that Conway's tiling groups had on combinatorics and on a relatively new branch of mathematics that studies random tilings. So let me show you random tilings. Oh, that's just going to start up a movie again. Let me X out of there. So here's just a sample of what are known as random tilings. Uh, for me, the starting point in random tilings was the fact that tilings of regions by dominoes can be understood in the same sort of three-dimensional way that works so nicely for tilings of regions by rhombuses. Your eyes and visual cortex don't do the interpretation automatically this time, but your cerebral cortex can. And for reasons that I don't have time to go into, this way of looking at domino tilings three-dimensionally suggested to me that it would be very natural to study domino tilings of this sort of region, which hardly anyone had looked at before, and which my collaborators and I named Aztec diamonds. This is an Aztec diamond of order 25, tiled by dominoes. The number of domino tilings of the Aztec diamond of order n turns out to always equal 2 to the power of the nth triangle number. And if you choose one of those tilings uniformly at random so that all tilings are equally likely, with overwhelmingly high probability, you'll pick one that resembles this in the sense of having four regions in the corners, north, south, east, and west, where the tiles line up in a brickwork fashion, and a region in the middle where horizontal and vertical tiles are jumbled together. Putting it differently, nearly all the tilings look like this. And the most amazing part is the boundary between the brickwork in the corners and the jumble in the middle converges to a perfect circle as the size of the Aztec diamond goes to infinity. One of the most powerful tools for understanding phenomena of this kind for random tilings is the three-dimensional representation of domino tiling, illustrated here in a beautiful picture by Benjamin Young. 
The three-dimensional point of view also gives rise to efficient algorithms for choosing a tiling uniformly at random. Here, for instance, is a program that chooses at random one of the rhombus tilings of the regular hexagon of order 10. It uses a method called coupling from the past, which you can think of as a kind of a variant of the Kruskal count, which is a card trick I learned about from, any guesses? Martin Gardner's column. And the tiling, the interpretation of two-dimensional tilings as three-dimensional surfaces is a key ingredient. Yes, is there a question over there? Yeah, have you considered extending this to higher dimensions? <laughs> <laughs> when you try to analyze three-dimensional tilings using the fourth dimension, it doesn't usually help. This is probably related to the fact that most lattice-based models in statistical mechanics are exactly solvable in two dimensions, but not in three. And that may have something to do with the fact that our universe is three-dimensional, unless, of course, it's 11-dimensional. Conway's own Princeton colleague, Andrei Okunkov, has, some, some, has done some of the most high-tech work in this area. He and his collaborators prove results about random tilings using algebraic geometry and partial differential equations. And other researchers use tools from random matrix theory. And I'm doing all this mathematical name dropping not to induce higher math anxiety in, in all the non-mathematicians in the room, but to throw into sharper relief the fact that all this deep work can be traced back to Conway's interest in very down-to-earth questions about tilings. Conway's work as a whole is a kind of existence proof. It proves that it's possible to do research that bridges the gap between serious math and recreational math. Most of my best work as a mathematician flowed directly or indirectly from Conway's work on tilings. So I say, thank you, John. And thank you.